we are live in YouTube. All right, let me get the music going then. You want to go ahead and be yeah, out? I'll say that. Thank you, Dr. Ivan. And we are going live in five, four, three, two. We are now live. All right, we'll just give a second for some people to join. Okay, great. So let's get started. Uh, happy summer, everybody, and welcome to uh, this month's Miami Global Brain Tumor Sym Symposium. Um, just gonna short introduction here while we get started. Uh, just quick introductions. As you know, my name is Mike Ivan. I'm one of the brain tumor specialists here at the University of Miami, and I'm joined by my co-directors, Dr. Komatar, who's a professor and, and program director of our residency. Dr. Morko is professor and co-chairman also director of our skull base and cerebrovascular program, and Dr. Benjamin, assistant professor and director of our skull base lab. Uh, so our 38th session of our brain tumor symposiums, and we couldn't do it without the help of University of Miami and Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Department of Surgery and all of the administration that helps us each week. So thank you to all those who make it happen. Uh, if you have any more questions about uh, tonight's symposium or about um, our, our future symposiums, you can always find us on social media or our website. All of the lectures get posted to YouTube, so you can watch them over again, and we've had thousands of views, um, I think, of people who have done that. So please take advantage of that. Uh, I also would like to bring to, to light some of the other symposiums that we have. Uh, one Monday a month, we have the Pediatric Neurosurgery Symposium. I know Dr. Ruck has already been on that one. We also have a cerebrovascular and skull-based symposium. The next one's July 15th. It's going to be advanced skull-based topics with a, a great group of young and uh, old um, neurosurgeons, which will be great to kind of compare and contrast uh, some of the techniques that they'll be presenting. Uh, next month on our symposium for brain tumors, we'll be welcoming uh, one of my chief residents from uh, residency, Dr. Sinai. He's now a director of a brain tumor center at the Barrow, who, who's going to be talking about some new technologies in glioma surgery. So be sure to tune in then. It'll be an exciting talk. Um, as far as tonight's symposium, please, participants, uh, make sure you ask questions. Uh, we'll try to get to all of them uh, throughout the night, but use the Q&A button. It's the easiest way to keep track. We don't offer CME, but you will get an email confirming your, your participation tonight. And please be sure to like, follow, and share our videos on um, social media, on the internet, 
so that we can continue to grow and share uh, this amazing knowledge that we, we get every month. Uh, so this week, uh, this month, we have a great group of panelists. I actually have the pleasure of saying they're all our, our new brain tumor fellows here at the University of Miami. Dominique Higgins, who joins us from Columbia, uh, and Tesh Patel, who joins us from Rutgers, and Dr. Cater, who's uh, our old enfolded uh, brain tumor fellow from here at the University of Miami, and they'll be discussing tonight's cases. For our special guest tonight, uh, I'm sure if you have anything to do with neurosurgery, you, you know who Dr. Rutka is, world-renowned uh, neurosurgeons, but we have a lot of international um, uh, kind of people who participate every, every month. So uh, let me just do give him the due fact of, of everything that he's accomplished. He's a world-renowned pediatric neurosurgeon at the University of Toronto and acts as the RS McLaughlin Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, he subspecializes in, in both brain tumors and epilepsy and works primarily at the, sick, uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Um, he has a, a brain tumor laboratory that's been extremely successful, uh, a really tremendous physician scientist, and he focuses on molecular biology of tumor growth as well as invasion uh, in brain tumors, and he leads uh, the Brain Tumor Research Center also at SickKids. He's been the past chair of the Division of Neurosurgery also at Toronto. Academically, he's been uh, extremely productive, uh, over 500 peer-reviewed uh, uh, manuscripts, He's uh, in 2014, he was named the editor in chief of the Journal for Neurosurgery and just done a, a fantastic job of just raising the level of, uh, of that uh, journal to, to, to a great area. And, and while doing so, really kind of uh, publicizing the importance of, of the journal and also educating uh, the young neurosurgeons, medical students, and residents on how to improve their contributions to academic neurosurgery. Uh, he's also co edited several uh, neurosurgery textbooks, including the one up here in the corner on neurooncology of CNS tumors. He's acted as a past president for WNS as well as the Academy, and in 2019 was uh, given the Cushing Medal at WNS, which is the most prestigious award uh, given to a WNS member for his contributions to technology and innovation in brain tumors. So uh, we really can't thank him enough for taking the time out of his busy schedule to tell, talk to us tonight about a very complicated topic, uh, and, and we're very grateful to hear from him. So thank you, Dr. Rutka, for your time. Great, thanks very much, Michael, and thanks for the invitation. I must say it's a pleasure to be back in Miami. I've, I've visited on several prior occasions in this first time, of course, virtually. And I must say you've, you're doing it right at the University of Miami. And what you've done for all of us during the pandemic really deserves mention and acknowledgement. So congratulations to you for putting on these virtual symposia, for bringing us all together, for providing information at a time of great need across the world. So fantastic. Uh, and I'm truly privileged to take part in the symposium today. So Michael, thank you. I, I know you through the, the journal. And Nitesh, I just met. And of course, I know Jacques, I know Rick uh, Komatar and uh, Alan Levy, many of you there. I won't name everybody, but so thank, thank you. And uh, I thought what I would do today is speak a little bit about an area that's very interesting, at least to me, and it's going to be primarily a uh, clinical talk today. And although Michael did mention that I do research, I'll, I'll have a little bit to say about the research, but essentially I'm gonna talk about clinical cases and approaches to the brainstem, uh, because this is very important, I think, for all neurosurgical oncologists uh, to know about. So the uh, title slide that you see here, and I'll just go to um, the screen. The title slide is actually a response or an answer to a question that was asked of me for my examinations as a neurosurgeon in Canada. We have um, a written exam and it's not multiple choice. You have to actually draw diagrams and figures and things like this. The question was at the level of the uh, inferior collicula, draw, draw the brainstem, draw the midbrain and all of its nuclei and pathways. And so Think about that yourself and ask yourself that question if you could handle that one uh, for an exam question. It was quite, uh, you know, a revealing question. Okay, brainstem tumors in children, also in adults, the same, uh, long thought to be inaccessible, but now we have all these great technologies and tools that we use to get there and to get there safely. Uh, but I will classify them to you according to their anatomical location and uh, since the era of MRI scan, this has become a lot easier. So midbrain tumors can be focal or tectal, uh, pontine tumors, diffuse intrinsic, dorsally exophytic or focal or cervical medullary tumors as listed there. Uh, these are the smallest tumors uh, known in the body that can kill you. These are called tectal astrocytomas and they're, they kill you not by their size, of course, not by their invasion or aggressiveness, but rather by the location within the CSF uh, draining pathways. And so 
they're very slow growing, if at all, in terms of their growth rate. And CSF diversion is all that you need for most of these tumors. And uh, these were first described uh, by this fellow. This is Dr. Alex Sanford, uh, who was um, a uh, neurosurgeon in uh, Mississippi for years and years. And um, he uh, published this as pencil gliomas. That was the term that he applied to them first, but that was the first time these tumors had come to light in terms of their uh, presence in the nomenclature. Uh, here's a three month old male, uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. Back in those days, this is like 1990, um, you know, before we had real uh, great access to MR, at least before surgery, um, then, you know, we just placed the shunt. But nowadays we would do something, I think, a little bit different. And you can see on the MRI scan, thickening of the tectal plate here and you, yeah, an occlusion of the aqueduct. Here's an example of a tectal glioma. You can see here, I'm pointing on my screen, and uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. You can see here the flare signal change. Uh, in addition to some signal change in the thalamus, which is a little bit unusual. And this is a 10 year old male who had worsening headaches and a family history of GBM, but we did ETV alone. And as you can see here on the arrow, uh, a nice uh, flow void is seen. And that's all that's needed by and large for these uh, types of tumors. Another case of tectal astrocytoma, you can see the lesion here in the, um, the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. Uh, you can see it here quite nicely on the sagittal MRI scan. And this child had papilledema, so we did the same thing. We did um, an ETV, had a really good result, and she felt so great after the surgery, she went out and did trampolining. And because she had a, a pressure change with a gradient now from the ETV, she ended up getting uh, an acute uh, epidural hematoma that you can see there that, um, that was managed conservatively. But you have to be careful in the postoperative period in some of these patients. Another case here, uh, eight month old. Uh, and uh, this one I, I'm showing you not because there's a tectal glioma there, but rather there can be very subtle changes in and around the tectum. This is a web that's seen in the region of the aqueduct and that required a um, ETV and this patient did extremely well after that. So I, I know this is uh, very routine for all of you. You've learned how to do this uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, but this is a very nice video that shows you beautiful anatomy. You see the dorsum cella, you see the pituitary stalk, you see the basilar artery there. Uh, beneath the basilar, of course, is the brainstem. You have to be very careful so as not to injure the fornix when you're using endoscopic techniques in this area. Uh, in this particular strategy, um, a coagulation is made on top of the, uh, the dorsum cellae that you can see there, and then we'll use a technique to expand this, and then uh, a balloon technique afterwards that you'll see. Uh, so there are many different ways of doing this. I've seen folks use the laser. I've seen uh, sharp uh, instruments uh, inserted. Here's a balloon that's uh, showing you how to make the ETV, but you ac actually always have to see the basilar artery. Here's another uh, currently applied technique where using a, a stylet, we make an opening and then um, essentially spread that with uh, a endoscopy forcep. And then that allows you to uh, penetrate that space, but you have to see the basilar artery without an arachnoid web over it in order for this job to be done completely. So this uh, video is showing you another technique. Uh, I showed you the balloon technique on the previous slide. This is a spreading technique. Uh, you can spread in different directions, you know, usually at right angles to each other so that you can get the, the largest stoma possible. And it's a fairly safe procedure. There are very few um, complications associated with it. Uh, sometimes tectal lesions are quite large, as in this case here that you see. And uh, these, uh, you're not going to get away just with doing an uh, ETV. So Sometimes you need to operate on, on these types of tumors. This patient had a paranoid syndrome, so a limitation of upward gaze. And this is the post-op. You can see pre-op, post-op. And um, what we did was um, a open procedure showing a video here of that. We've opened up into the cyst now, and we've done a um, removal of the cyst wall uh, by carefully using dissectors to uh, bring the cyst wall in and removing it like that. This was a pilocytic astrocytoma in a child who had NF1. Not all of these tumors are gliomas. Occasionally, you'll get a tumor looking like this in the tectal area. So this is in the tectum. It's not in the pineal uh, region. So 18-year-old, headaches, amenorrhea, papilledema, 
Uh, we did an approach here using image guidance, open occipital transtentorial approach. There's an image from the surgery. This was germ cell tumor, so germinoma. So uh, you can think that some of these are gliomas and you, you might actually make a mistake if you don't uh, get a tissue uh, diagnosis on some of these uh, lesions. Many different approaches to the tectal region shown here. Um, you can be familiar with many of these, as you can see. Occipital transtentorial was mentioned on the previous case, supracerebellar, as in this case, and uh, subcroidal approaches. Um, there can be retrosplenial, several, you know, subtemporal, many different ways of getting there. Uh, I'll just bring your attention to this in uh, Neurosurgical Focus in the July issue. Great videos for you to see on pineal regions tumor. This is not exactly the tectal area, but it's pretty close, right? So uh, I ask you to go in and take a look at some of these videos. It's really fantastic. And uh, there's a new website on the journal that will take you to these uh, various uh, different uh, video segments. Okay, and then um, just, uh, this is really interesting situation. Uh, before and after each of you, you can see the change in the size of the ventricles. A case report uh, series that I put together with Rick Boop uh, several years ago, this patient had an enhancing tectal mass. And then the only thing we did was surgery, ETV, and the mass kind of went away. And the enhancement went away completely. We can't explain it. We don't know what it represents. We didn't biopsy it. So we couldn't actually prove what the pathology was, but an interesting finding after ETV only and no further therapy was uh, required. Okay, let's move next to focal midbrain tumors. And these tumors are very challenging. They're located here. You can see on the schematic focal enhancing involving typically the tegmentum of the, of the midbrain, hemiparesis, upper, upper cranial nerve palsies. And many of these will be amenable for resection. So years ago from our hospital, uh, sick kids, um, Hoff, Dr. Hoffman and myself and others put this uh, series of patients together. This is a archival video from when Dr. Hoffman was operating the either 19, late 1980s or early 1990s entering. And he's done a subtemporal approach here and he's using the cavitron in the brainstem to resect this midbrain tumor. So this is going back, you know, uh, many 30 plus years and uh, showing that we were operating even back then on these uh, tumors. More contemporary uh, case, nine, uh, nine-year-old, hemiparesis, and you can see the lesion is within the midbrain. It has a cyst associated with it, uh, image-guided resection. Uh, we used the middle temporal gyrus approach. It was a pilocytic astrocytoma. Uh, there's the end result, um, and it's done extremely well. But image guidance, yeah, I think it's fairly important for a lot of these cases, and I would encourage you to think about having this definitely on board uh, as you're doing resection. Here's another child, six-year-old, with this uh, very you know, a significant lesion um, in the uh, midbrain, uh, third nerve palsy, left-sided hemiparesis, uh, a biopsy was done uh, stereotactically at first that showed low-grade glioma. So we elected to resect this uh, transclosally, as you can see here, and uh, you can see where the crosshairs are here at the bottom. That's the depth of our penetration with the interhemispheric approach a long way down and having the cavitron way down there. But there's the pre-op and there's the immediate post-op. And then here's the many year post-op, seven years. Surgery was all that was done. Of course, the biology is on our side, this pilocytic astrocytoma. And this child has done exceptionally well, graduated and is off in uh, university at the moment. A uh, 12 year old with this lesion in the midbrain, uh, right hemiparesis, as you can see here, and uh, papilledema. And this is the resection afterwards, uh, showing the extent of resection, some hematoma in the area of the resection cavity. Pilocytic astrocytoma. So many of these will turn out to be pilocytic astrocytomas that you can see here, 10 year old, right hemiparesis, otherwise was intact. Um, there's the lesion on the sagittal, you know, pretty formidable lesion. Uh, we chose a, a mid temporal gyrus approach here. There are many different ways you could approach this. You could have done a trans uh, sylvian, you know, splitting sylvian fissure approach to get here. And here's the immediate post-op. This child did extremely well. Uh, no significant uh, worsening in terms of neurological function. Went on to get some chemotherapy for this residual and has been stable since. Another lesion flipped over on the other side here. You can see in this child with the question of the diagnosis, NF1 autism. 
10 year old, uh, brief history. Uh, we did all of this, turned out to be low grade glioma and there's the resection. So again, coming in this, this time in middle temporal gyrus, but again, several different options for you to consider approaching these lesions, but have navigation available, know your boundaries, use intraoperative neural monitoring, and you can really do a, a, a major resection on these cases and the children do well. And based on the pathology, and the molecular biology subsequently, they may be candidates if there's residual for uh, chemotherapy that can be tried uh, over the course of time. Okay, the next tumor is diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. And this is one that uh, unfortunately we don't have a surgical solution for. Uh, these patients present with cranial nerve palsies and long track signs, and usually they're quite young. Hydrocephalus occurs late in the course of the disease and they're all anaplastic tumors. The survival is less than a year and a half. Here's a 14 year old, uh, open biopsy uh, was performed for this. Is a little bit atypical. First of all, the age is a little bit atypical. There's the lesion you can see in the brainstem. Doesn't take up the whole pons, but we decided we'd do a biopsy under ultrasound guidance. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't come through on this one, but you can see here, survived 24 months. We uh, found the diagnosis was anaplastic and um, this child of course uh, suffered the end result as many of these children do. So the question is, do you biopsy or not? Now more days, uh, especially in North America, more biopsies are being performed. This is from the French series from the Necker Institute in Paris, where they did biopsies of over 130 of these uh, types of lesions. And here's a 16-year-old male, again, atypical presentation for age. He happened to be an avid hockey player, and um, he underwent um, radiation therapy and chemotherapy, we decided in this case not to do a biopsy. And sadly, he passed after about 18 months. So uh, this is a little uh, video, a little bit of propaganda from the University of Toronto for you on one of our discoveries uh, related to the genes involved in diffuse intrinsic New pontine glioma. on a deadly form of brain cancer. DIPG affects children and teens. And over 90% of those afflicted die within 18 months of being diagnosed. But as Stephen D'Souza explains, researchers in Toronto say they found a genetic clue about the disease. This is on our trip to Dominican after we had just gotten the diagnosis. Stan and Marisa Bertoya haven't changed their son Daniel's room since his death six years ago. At age 16, Daniel was diagnosed with a rare brain tumor and was told he had less than a year to live. Losing your eyesight, losing your hearing, losing your speech, losing your mobility, uh, basically just, just devastating to, to see your son going, going through that. His parents scoured the world for help, but found no effective treatment. We hung on, you know, to every little thing that we could possibly hang on to, but really there was nothing there. Before his death at age 18, family and friends organized fundraisers, and Daniel had one wish for the money. He said, Dad, I want it directly to research, so I'll find it here. And this big uh, white blob in the middle is the tumor. Daniel's type of cancer, known as DIPG, is diagnosed in a few hundred young people in North America each year. Located on the brainstem, it's inoperable and chemotherapy is ineffective. But using new technology, researchers at the Hospital for Sick Children discovered cancer genes they hadn't seen before. The genes mutated in this cancer are completely different than what we see in adults, and so we cannot use the same drugs as what we were using in adults. That told them they needed new and unique treatments. We can you know, go to somebody with this diagnosis and rather than it being a death sentence, maybe there's some hope that some chemotherapies are going to work now. While that's still years away, after raising more than half a million dollars for research, Marisa and Stan are happy to see progress. To get this little baby step right now, it's just amazing and I'm hoping that you know, it'll turn into giant steps one day. His favorite player. They say this gives them even more motivation to keep raising money and awareness to help fulfill their son's final wish. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Vaughan, Ontario. Yeah, so I know Tampa Bay is in the finals of the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs along with Montreal. So a Canadian versus American uh, uh, match right now. So we'll see how that all plays out in the next uh, game or so. Uh, so the genetics of uh, these tumors kind of shown on this slide here in this one um, from Cynthia Hawkins is from the Toronto group, ACVR1 mutation. I'll speak about that in a moment, but um, four papers pub published simultaneously in 2014 on this. And 
many good review articles now I'll just um, you know refer you to this is one that we published a few years ago showing the molecular players that are involved in DIPG and the more recent one here uh, anyone interested I can send this uh, to you but showing now that uh, the types of um, epigenetic and genetic changes that are involved in that are steering us in the direction of uh, some types of chemotherapy over others. And everything you need to know about DIPG is found on this single slide. Um, I'll just leave it up here for a moment so you can take a look at it, but everything from prognosis down to ongoing clinical trials is here. And it's summarized in that uh, clinical review that was on the, uh, the previous slide. But all the current genetic mutations that we know of are, are listed here and so on. So uh, as I said, if you're interested, just to email me, I'll send it to you. Uh, so lots of uh, work in clinical trials um, over the horizon, but nothing so far has worked. Why has, uh, has there been no effective treatment with this disease? Well, it might be because the drugs that we're using aren't just getting to the target site. Most of these lesions, as you know, are non-enhancing. So the blood-brain barrier is intact in the brainstem. So it might be that um, we can't get the chemotherapy across. So uh, Mark Swedan from uh, New York has been using convection-enhanced delivery, a technique I'm sure you're all familiar with, as a means to try to treat uh, DIPG. And he's had a number of clinical trials, and they're looking promising. Uh, we chose to look at MR-guided focused ultrasound for DIPG because uh, of its potential for overcoming the blood-brain barrier and delivering chemotherapeutics across it into the brainstem. Uh, we had a, an experimental paradigm that we used in uh, mice, and we were able to do a high uh, throughput uh, drug screening, and we found a number of candidates that looked interesting, one of which was carboplatin, had never, not carboplatin, excuse me, a doxorubicin that had never been used before. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, tumor, and it was the the most uh, sensitive of all the the drugs used. And in our animal model, you can see we can increase the amount of doxorubicin in the brainstem when compared to the brain by using MR guided focused uh, ultrasound. So very interesting technique. We published this um, just a few years ago as a proof of principle, but not without a not with a tumor model. This was in a, a normal brainstem model. So we then developed a brainstem model of uh, DIPG, and we had the RCAS model that we use, a genetically engineered model, but also an implant model, a, a xenograft model. And the xenograft model actually turned out to be better for us in terms of our studies. And this is the schematic that shows the workflow for MR-guided focused ultrasound in this uh, animal model. And we were able to do this implanted tumor and then treat the mice with MR-guided focused ultrasound and you can see that we could increase the concentration of the uh, doxorubicin in the brainstem as calculated by uh, mass spectroscopy, uh, able to do that uh, quite nicely. After we had done the treatment, the KI67 index went down and our early animal survival studies are showing us that we are getting a, an advantage. So uh, we published this recently in um, the Journal of Controlled Release uh, this past year. And that led us to develop this uh, clinical trial. Those, those preclinical data enabled us to put together this clinical trial, and we're hoping to enroll our first patients uh, either late this summer or early in the fall. And I know at um, University of Miami, you, you have MR guided focused ultrasound. I've been speaking with John Ragab about it, and that, uh, that you uh, may or may not want to be a part of this uh, clinical trial uh, going forward. We're in the process of um, enrolling other centers to join us in this, um, in this strategy. Okay, the next tumor type is dorsally exophytic brainstem tumor shown in schematic here. Slow growing tumors, longstanding symptoms, cranial nerve palsies. And these are tumors that you can operate on, unlike DIPG. And these are um, frequently uh, resectable. And so we recommend not rating these up front. And if they recur, you can operate on them again. And most of them turn out to be low-grade gliomas. And that uh, individual I was showing you there was Dr. Harold Hoffman, who was a very famous uh, pediatric neurosurgeon from uh, SickKids Hospital. So here's some uh, MR features of um, these dorsally exophytic tumors that you can see here. Sometimes you can distinguish those from other types of um, cerebellar tumors like cerebellar astrocytoma just on the basis of the MRI scan itself. Here's a 14-year-old uh, Jehovah's Witness, uh, ataxia, headache, uh, papilledema, extremely vascular tumor um, arising from the brainstem. 
we did a near total resection. Here's the uh, lesion shown in the uh, pre-op setting. Uh, post-operatively, whenever you see a lot of blood like this and on the post-op MRI, it means that the surgeon's had a hard day uh, because there's been a lot of bleeding and it goes retrograde through the aqueduct. And uh, so this child had a stormy course afterwards, had a number of cranial nerve palsies, most of which resolved, but she was quite ataxic and uh, had a swallowing disturbance and took a long time to get back on her feet again, but finally did. Now here's the post-op showing a very nice result, just surgery by itself. I have permission to show the child. Uh, this is on her graduation from uh, Sick Kids Hospital, and uh, she has done extraordinarily well and has gone off to university. Okay, the next tumor type is focal uh, pontine brainstem tumor, newly recognized group of brainstem tumors. You can see quite clearly here on the CT scan what some of these tumors look like. Uh, maybe they'll be benign, some of them, but often they'll be anaplastic, but you should consider operating on these, especially if they present to a peel surface. Here's some further examples of these. This is a pilocytic astrocytoma. Um, and the approaches to these tumors usually require lateral approaches to the brainstem. And there are many different ways to do this. And skull blades approaches have helped us enormously get to these uh, locations. Uh, here's one you can see uh, right-sided uh, focal pontine tumor, seven-year-old, recent history, and there's the lesion that you see. We chose this approach, which was a retro labyrinthine pre-sigmoid approach um, that you can see here uh, in diagrammatic form. The nice thing about uh, approaches like uh, these ones um, is that you can avoid uh, brain retraction, right? You're basically letting the bone and bony removal do the work for you in terms of the exposure. And so we did that approach here. We've landed on the lateral surface of the brainstem. You can see a uh, cranial nerve there, uh, seven. And we've done the, um, the approach and we've had a, a really uh, good opportunity to do the resection. Um, the wake up was uh, uncomplicated. He did extremely well, but unfortunately this turned out to be an anaplastic tumor and he received radiation therapy for it and survived about uh, two years afterwards. Okay, the final brainstem uh, uh, tumor type that I'll talk about is the cervical medullary brainstem tumor as uh, depicted here schematically on the sagittal, you can see it. And I'm bringing Dr. Fred Epstein to attention here because he was um, the first, I think, to popularize this particular tumor and to instruct neurosurgeons that these are tumors that we can operate on. And he had a large series of these tumors. Uh, he, he relied heavily on interoperative um, neural monitoring. And he was one of the first to use that uh, routinely in the course of these uh, types of tumors. And they can affect the high cervical spinal cord and the medulla simultaneously. Typically low cranial nerve dysfunction and long tract and cerebellar signs. This is kind of what they look like at the time of surgery. You can see swollen uh, cervical medullary junction here. Typically we do posterior fossa craniotomy, laminoplasties, midline uh, myelotomies and uh, cautious debulking with neural monitoring. This is a instance where I think uh, the neural monitoring is indispensable. You almost always should have this available if you're planning to tackle tumors uh, like this. And so uh, here we are with neural monitoring. Every, we have great uh, intraoperative uh, monitoring at uh, SickKids. And so every cranial nerve can be monitored, uh, brainstem, can be monitored and uh, we're very fortunate to have that scenario. I suspect you do too at the University of Miami. Okay, this looks like a formidable lesion, cervical medullary brainstem tumor, a 14 year old who presented with recurrent pneumonia. And it's not uncommon for these um, patients to have many admissions to hospital before somebody thinks uh, to order an MRI scan because they're presenting with other things at first. And, um, and so um, the diagnosis can be delayed horse voice, 12th nerve palsy, nystagmus, ataxia. Here's the lesion at the time of surgery. There's the um, magnified view, midline myelotomy, opening, cautious debulking, uh, neural monitoring. And there's the post-op result, what it looks like. And here's the post-operative scan. You can see a very decent resection uh, kyphosis can happen in the post-operative period. And so many of these children might uh, go on to require some type of post-operative uh, stabilization. The other thing to mention too, is that many of these types of tumors turn out to be ganglioglomas in this cervical medullary region. 
And that's fairly good news because it means that they can uh, be uh, beneficiaries of some chemotherapy uh, down the road as needed, or if it's really required uh, radiation treatment, but that wouldn't be our first uh, treatment choice. Okay, and here's a uh, just a real-time video to show you cerv cervical medullary brainstem tumor. Uh, you see, of course, the cerebellum is up here, now doing our midline uh, myelotomy and uh, opening up, uh, identifying, if possible, a tumor plane uh, cautiously, um, then doing uh, biopsies, and then you'll see the Cavitron come in and do some work for us. Um, and doing this uh, carefully stepwise uh, with the monitoring as mentioned, um, the tumor can be exposed and then the lesion can be uh, debulked in, uh, in large part. And there's the uh, Cavitron in view. Again, let the tumor come up to you into the Cavitron. And then you'll see we'll be opening up more superiorly here into the medulla. And uh, while we were doing this, uh, the debulking, we got intraoperative monitoring changes, motor evoke changes. So uh, we decided at that point, having done a decent resection uh, more rostrally uh, to hold off on further, uh, you, you watch, you wait, you, you use uh, cold saline, uh, you watch what happens to the return of activity of your monitoring, and you go to a place where you're not getting any changes as we were here. Uh, this is more caudally, and that's the final view. So just a video demonstration of uh, some of these tumors. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sure you're seeing that I've got a blank screen here. I don't know what happened in the um, transfer of materials in this uh, scenario, but here's the video. This was a child who had a cervical medullary brain scan and represented with cystic changes that we went back and, and drained the cyst for, and she had a really good response to that, and she's done extremely well. There's the uh, post-operative view inside the brainstem that you can see there. And uh, she's done extraordinarily well. And uh, there's the image and there she is having, again, permission to show her image. She's also graduated, gone off to university without needing radiation treatment. So at some times, these tumors turn out to be a chronic disease and uh, they can go on, they can smolder on for some time. And uh, many different trials of chemotherapy can be utilized. Uh, I didn't uh, prepare slides today to talk to you about uh, the chemotherapy for low-grade gliomas, especially in the brainstem in children, but this whole field has advanced enormously with a variety of, um, of targets. Uh, the BRAF uh, um, gene, for example, is often uh, fused in this particular uh, tumor and others in the brainstem and, and can become a target for focal chemotherapy that's targeted uh, many MEK and uh, MAP kinase inhibitors are often used for these uh, types of tumors. A six-year-old uh, had debulking years ago, then went on to have a couple of subsequent surgeries, ganglia glioma. As they progress and as they do grow and, and as they infiltrate, they can become G-tube and ventilator dependent as this child was. Um, so I don't have a picture there, but um, he wrote a book on his... Uh, experience um, having had a brainstem tumor and having been on a ventilator and, and so on. And uh, as I said, can be a, a chronic uh, disease in many cases. Uh, this is a report from uh, the group out of St. Jude. So Rick Book's name is here, Paul uh, uh, Klimo's name is here. And uh, their tumors are very similar to the ones uh, that, that I'll, you know, I've shown you already today for this disease and there's the survival curve. So it's not as good as some of the others that, uh, that we talked about today, but it's still not bad. It's not, uh, and uh, with chemotherapy now arising, uh, some of these tumors, some of these patients can do extraordinarily well uh, over many, many years, decades, uh, for example. So uh, surgery can provide stabilization of the disease. If there's progression, you can consider either chemotherapy or radiation therapy or you can come back and do uh, more surgery. Cervical spine instability can lead to stabilization uh, efforts that are necessary. So spinal fusions may be necessary. I mentioned the bit about the BRAP mutations and other types of targeted chemotherapy, again, with the MEK and MAP kinase uh, inhibitors being helpful for these types of cases. So here's a case um, when we decided not to do aggressive resection, but rather very limited resection. It was coming out of the medulla that you can see here. And uh, this is after the surgery, you know, uh, still uh, considerable residual left behind, but after chemotherapy, 
this uh, virtually went away altogether. And this child went off to university and has done extraordinarily well as pursuing medicine as a career path um, in her life. Uh, just to show you that radiation therapy is not used up front for all the tumors I talked about with the exception of DIPG. And uh, we published years ago um, what happens in some cases where you use uh, radiation therapy in some of these tumors and the development of anaplastic change, which you know perhaps could have developed um, on its own uh, spontaneously, but um, may have been expedited by the use of radiation therapy, especially in children that have NF1. We've learned not to use radiation therapy for kids with uh, NF1 with low-grade tumors. So uh, uh, just reserve radiation therapy, be cautious about using it. I know the pediatric neuro-oncologists are very wary of using radiation therapy for any kind of low-grade tumor, whereas it was used when I was starting my practice in neurosurgery 30 years ago, radiation was uh, you know, a standard therapy for these tumors, but not so today. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up and uh, summarize these. These tumors can be classified according to the tumor types based on anatomical location, Surgery has a role to play in many different tumor types, as I mentioned to you. The neurosurgical approaches are based on tumor location, navigation, monitoring, I mentioned, are really important. And now chemotherapy can be targeted towards the main genetic uh, defects that are identified within the tumors themselves. So when to operate, when not to operate, that's always a good question in neurosurgery. Uh, the plus signs means, yeah, this is a good place to operate. Um, the negative or minus signs mean uh, uh, be wary of operating here unless you're doing a biopsy, of course. And, uh, you know, these give you good indications as to when to think about doing surgery in these uh, particular cases. So uh, just remember the classification in uh, these uh, brainstem tumors in children, midbrain, pontine, and cervical medullary tumors. And with that, I'll uh, conclude. This is Sick Kids Hospital, and um, we're one of the the main uh, pediatric players for neuro-oncology across uh, North America. So our experience, I was very pleased to share with you today. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you, you folks may have. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was that was uh, an amazing whirlwind of, of all the possibilities of, of treatment and, and approaches and pathology in the brainstem. I had a couple questions for you though, uh, before we start with, for, for the mid vein reasons, you showed a lot of the tumors that were close to or, or involving the cortical spinal tract. I was wondering how much to use interoperative mapping uh, for some of those uh, tumors, especially in kids, uh, and is it, is it effective or, or not? Uh, you're talking about the, the midbrain tumors, Michael, I think, was it? Yeah, yes. yeah so yeah. yeah, we would do, um, as mentioned, interoperative monitoring. We use the, the trains of five technique on the cortical spinal tract, right? For being able to get like continuous mapping throughout. Um, and then as we're getting like deep inside the cavity and these, these lesions are quite deep by the time you get to them, uh, we can use these subcortical stimulating device if we have any questions about where the plane is between abnormal and uh, normal, uh, you know, brainstem. So, a combination of the, the mapping that we use and the subcortical stem will, I think, try to keep you as safe as possible for the resection of these, uh, these lesions. Um, and then for the pilocytic tumors, do you, what do you do with the capsule? Are you, are you pretty aggressive with that or do you just take out the, um, you know, the solid tumor part? Yeah, I think, you know, if you were in a situation where you had a well-defined capsule, and they mostly occur, Michael, in the, the cerebellum, right? So the, and those can abut the brainstem, but if they're those types of tumors that have a well-defined capsule, and let's say a cystic element associated with them, uh, it's been shown time and again that frequently the enhancing capsule, if it, if it does enhance on MRI, uh, will contain uh, tumor cells. So we try to go after those enhancing capsular elements, but if it's non-enhancing, you know, I'd be inclined to leave it alone if it's in a deep critical part of the, either the brainstem or the cerebellum. If it's, you know, hitting the deep cerebellar nuclei or something, I'd probably leave it behind if it's non-enhancing. Um, one of the questions with, with, since you have now some more experience with the focus ultrasound, uh, you know, I was always concerned with some of the newer, I guess, machines with the proximity to bone. 
and that's uh, how accurate and how much effect you or do you lose, I guess, when it's close to that. With brainstem lesions, is that something that you're concerned about? I mean, I'm sure you're going to be looking at it in the clinical trial, but um, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's always a concern about, uh, you know, the reverberation when you get close to the skull base with uh, focused ultrasound. So uh, we were able to pull this off in the animal model that I showed you, and that's a much smaller target than what we're going to be dealing with uh, in the human case. So I suspect that uh, we'll we'll be able to work our way around this and um, be able to, to handle and, and navigate through the difficulties with the bony skull base, which is adjacent to the brainstem, as you mentioned. And, uh, and I, we're really hopeful that we'll be able to get the uh, very fine, sophisticated and accurate uh, localization of the um, focused ultrasound and then allowing for the uh, transmission of the chemotherapy into the area of, of most uh, need um, by, by virtue of having worked out the, the details and the coordinates of uh, the focused ultrasound in, in uh, humans. So this will be the first in, in man study, and we're hoping, as, as mentioned, to start this up in, in July. And uh, Dr. Shelley Wang, one of our pediatric neurosurgeons, is asking about, is it only going to be for DIPG or is it going to be for all tumors of the brainstem or, or deep brain tumors, or, or are you just focusing purely on DIPG in the first uh, iteration? Yeah, thanks, Shelley, for the question. Yeah, the question, the question and the answer to the question is really just at the moment for DIPG. We're not um, thinking about using it at this stage for other types of uh, tumors and our protocol is set up just for DIPG doesn't mean that it can't be used at the University of Toronto. Our adult uh, neurosurgical oncologists are using it for METs and GBMs now uh, with breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. But, um, but for the kids and for our, our series of uh, cases, we're planning on just keeping it uh, confined to DIPG. Uh, one of the questions here by... Um... Uh, somebody called Alim Baramov wants to know a little bit more about what your thoughts are on why these tumors uh, kind of occur in this location uh, in the brainstem and why do they not spread to other areas of the CNS or outside the CNS? Uh, just kind of your overall kind of thoughts maybe on that topic. Yeah, I would say that um, mostly they are uh, confined to the brainstem as, as you had uh, mentioned. On the other hand, uh, when, for example, DIPG is late in the course of disease, it will definitely disseminate along CSF pathways and you'll see involvement of the, uh, the leptomeninges in the spine and other parts of the brain. So that clearly can happen. And then, you know, curiously, even benign tectal tumors, they can metastasize. And years ago, we, we published uh, a case report and there've been other reports published on uh, low grade tumors, pilocytics even metastasizing to distal places. And it's hard to know exactly why that is, what the biology of those tumors indicates. Uh, that's a rare situation, but uh, sometimes they will spread outside uh, even um, the brainstem for these types of typically uh, focal tumors. Uh, and, and while we get one of the uh, fellows here ready, uh, Dom, do you want to maybe present while I ask the last question here, yeah. get your slides up? Uh, one other question was, you know, we have a lot of literature on extended resection for low-grade tumors, um, and, and I want to know your thoughts on how that extends into the brainstem and, and some of these tumors that kind of are, are expanding out into the peduncle or the cerebellum. You know, is there any role in, in taking out some of the safe areas of, of these tumors if you don't think you can take out the brainstem part or, or just biopsy is, is always kind of the first thing that you start with? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I mean, yeah, there's. Uh, it's it's interesting how the 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 notion and the world has changed in terms of our philosophy on what to do with these low grade tumors and extent of resection. Uh, I, I you know I still think that um, you know a do no harm is very appropriate adage at this stage and try to keep yourself as safe as possible, uh, but try to push the boundaries as much as as you can. But you know the worst thing to have happen is pushing the boundaries having a tumor in a critical location like the brainstem, like in the midbrain, like I showed, uh, causing a neurological deficit that's gonna be lifelong and permanent and leaving residual tumor behind, right? So right. You, right. you don't wanna have that scenario. So where possible, yeah, follow those principles and it'll hold you in good stead. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Dom, do you wanna present your case? Yes. Um... But before, Dr. Arthur, thank you for a great talk. Uh, it was a great overview, as Dr. Ivan said. Uh, before, I had a couple of questions uh, for you before I share my, my case. Um, 
with regard to biopsying or not for for the IPG, what what's your kind of metric for whether or not to pursue one, especially with you know the role of you know histone mutations and and other markers that may impact therapy, and then along those lines, um, you know what 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 role do you think you know sampling um, you know, I wouldn't say error, but um, heterogeneity uh, plays in in the role for these tumors? Yeah, thanks. That's a great uh, question, Dom. So. Um, we, we were really hesitant to 20 years ago to biopsy any of these. And then uh, techniques became available to do this safely, usually using navigation and stereotactic techniques. Uh, but, you know, it didn't really change anything in terms of, you know, what you were going to do for the patients. But now, as I mentioned, with the opportunity to do molecular genetics, um, you can classify uh, the DIPGs into those that are going to be living, you know, a shorter time versus a longer time and also studying their genetic mutations in detail that might have clues to new therapies that uh, haven't been tried before. If you're in a center that does that, and, and you know, our center in Toronto, we do whole genome sequencing, we do the epigenetics, we do all of the uh, single cell, you know, testing um, on the tissues that come our way. So we get that information. And, you know, we're in a situation where we can use that. Um, so we think then biopsy is going to be important, even if it's a, you know, standard presenting DIPG that looks like all the world, like all the DIPGs that you've seen, yeah. we'll still do biopsies uh, just so we can get that information because we might learn something from all the genetic testing that we're doing at our center. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to show a, a case. Uh, it's work from, from my time at, at Columbia doing my research up here at one of the projects I worked on is we partnered with an industry and in, in our pediatric hemoncologist, uh, Sturgeon Sakharoulis and Dr. Felstein, our he's neurosurgeon, Dr. Bruce, uh, to get this trial off the ground, similar to Dr. Swedane, but using uh, convection enhanced delivery uh, for uh, DIPGs. And uh, we're nearing completion now. We're able to get the IND through the FDA during my, my research time. And, and uh, thankfully it's wrapping up. And uh, just showing an, an example here on the right of the T2, you can see the, the hypo intensity is the catheter placement with the biopsy track medial to it. And uh, we do an internal delivery system of this normal uh, a novel formulation of an HDAC inhibitor penibinostat. And you can see it get good coverage uh, throughout the, the pons in the region of the, of the lesion. Um, and there's also interest in, in focus ultrasound um, at, at Columbia as well with Fred. My, my question for you in, in designing trials that look more at efficacy though, like how do you, how do you study you know, the effects that, that you're getting? Because in the mouse, you can you know, take the whole pons at the end of the study and you can look at drug levels. Yeah. What, 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 what's your, you know, picking your brain here, what, what's your thoughts in terms of monitoring um, efficacy uh, for these trials? Do you do repeat biopsies? Do you think it's safe or? to try to do systemic uh, markers to, to check in. Yeah, so you know, these types of studies are slow to get off the ground because first of all, there's not like huge numbers of patients. And, and secondly, <laughs> what we have to do is we have to uh, show safety first, right? So mm -hmm. I have to prove our, our study is kind of safety and then efficacy. So safety yeah. being enrolling three patients with a small subset of the ponds being uh, broken down for its blood brain barrier another three patients where a larger section is going to be looked at. And then mm -hmm. another three patients where the whole pons is going to be targeted. Okay. So, you know, that's going to play out over the course of uh, a year or so before we get that safety information by itself. And then uh, we can ask the question about uh, efficacy subsequently. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we can't interfere with um, what's considered standard therapy right now. And standard therapy for DIPG is radiation treatment. So, our, our kids are going to be getting radiated first, and then we're going to be coming in with, um, you know, uh, the focused ultrasound. So it's not, that wasn't, you know, our preference, but we, we could not get it through our research ethics board unless we followed standard therapy and then added this on top of it. Yeah. Um, so then you have to ask the question, you know, probably you need to do this de novo before radiation therapy, if that's possible. And so that's going to take some time too. So it's just to show you that all these things are going to play out over the course of, you know, probably a couple of years or more. And yeah. the more centers that we can, can encourage to take part in this and the more centers that have MR guided focused ultrasound, I think the better it'll be for all of us in terms of moving uh, this field forward. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot.
Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, Natasha, you want to go? Hey, sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, Dr. Rucker, that was a great talk. You know, I, I think especially for myself, who's sort of obviously still in training as a fellow, is sort of finding an organized way to think about this and as opposed to just looking at it as a grab bag entity is, uh, is kind of nice. And I really appreciate your presentation on it. And, uh, you know, once again, thank you for joining us on this conference. Um, I have a case that we actually saw here in our tumor board uh, last week. Um, it was actually my first tumor board as a fellow here. So it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, it's pretty quick. I have a few slides. Um, so I'm just gonna get started with that. Yeah, so I think you're muted there, Nitesh. Uh, it keeps it kept muting me out for some reason. Uh, I think I'm back on now. Okay. Um, so it's a 61 year old female who has presented to uh, an outside institution in Romania, actually, um, back in February of 2020. She presented with dizziness at the time, and I think some other symptoms as well, which led to an imaging workup. The details of her visit are a little bit spotty. We have some uh, untranslated documents from Romania. Um, but at the time, they noted what was what seemed like a pontine lesion per description. We don't have any images from there. It was presumed to be a glioma. Um, there was no biopsy or anything done. However, it was treated medically uh, with 54 gray, 28 fractions, um, and two cycles of TMZ, which ended back in December of 2020. So, you know, a little less than a year after initial diagnosis. Again, no biopsy was done. Uh, and then she ended up in the States. Um, sort of lost a follow-up to her primary uh, sort of providers that had seen her in Romania and presented to us, uh, to our neurology team with left hemiparesis, had a new MRI done, which we could only compare to prior reports and showed an ex expansion of the, of the known lesion from the prior reports. Um, and uh, so using some axial images, the, le the leftmost image is a non-con axial T1 image. And again, you can see on the right side, um, you know, in the sort of ponds area and then going off into the breaking ponds, as you can see, there's an area of hypo intensity and then it, it does contrast enhance on the serial images towards the right. And these are sort of staggering up in uh, each cut uh, advances. And then I have some more views here as well. Here's a coronal view, uh, T1 plus, a SAG, and then a T2. Now this woman at this point, um, she hasn't had any further treatment. Um, we talked about our tour board and you know, I think ultimately this is more of an open-ended question, but we talked a lot about pediatric patients, but when you have an adult in this scenario, you know, we're sort of left in a 61 year old, so it was like a perplexing situation. And where do we go from here? She's received some sort of empiric treatment, so to speak, uh, for a presumed diagnosis. Um, you know, this is what we're, this is the entity we're facing with here. So what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Natasha. It's, it's a tough one, right? Because you don't have all the history you'd like to have from before. And uh, it sounds like the time interval from the radiation that was previously given to today, is that two years roughly? Or how long? Or do we know? Like when um, it would. So it seems like the treatment ended in December of 2020. So we're probably approaching at least half a year, okay. um, if not more. Yeah. And becoming symptomatic. Uh, this is yeah. sort of pat patchy enhancement, but the brainstem is really swollen, as you can see here. Like, I don't think this is going to be good news for this patient, but it probably is worthwhile to do a tissue biopsy or, or yeah, tissue diagnosis for sure. What, and how you go about doing that, you can choose any one of a number of ways. Um, you know, probably the easiest would be a uh, stereotactic biopsy, but you could also approach this open if you were worried about that in the number of different ways to get at this area. It seems like the enhancement is um, kind of ventral and lateral off to the uh, right side, if I'm uh, reading this uh, correctly. So um, yeah. yeah, so I mean, you could do like a subtemporal approach, you can see on your on your coronal there, um, you could split the tent and you could be right there, which, you know, if, if you were uh, in, interested in an open approach, but probably you get the information you want from a, a stereotactic biopsy or, or robot guided uh, biopsy, something like that. And I, 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 I think I would recommend that because I, I otherwise you're not going to know what you got here. And um, the safety of that procedure is, is pretty respected nowadays. A lot of series on brainstem biopsies in adults and in children uh, with acceptable morbidity. 
but I don't think this one's going to end well, given the, the symptoms that you're uh, describing that are new and the progression and um, age and the fact that radiation, um, this is a pretty uh, recent change in neurological status after radiation was completed in, in December. Yeah, no, I think uh, we sort of felt the same way during our tumor board discussions. Um, there, was, there was questions about getting some more imaging, um, you know, perhaps a spec scan, but yeah. I think, you know, we had, we had talked about doing a potential biopsy as well, and I'm sure, sure we'll bring her back up in our tumor board coming up. Yeah, yeah. Are you doing most of your needle biopsies kind of through the peduncle, or do you come a longer approach, transfrontal and kind of... Yeah, I, I've, done, I've done it always, um, you know, posterior fossa, base, you okay. know, sort of middle cerebell, cerebellar peduncle approach. I've come far frontal, heading, you know, posteriorly. That's worked out really well. So you, you just, just try to decide what the best trajectory is. And, right. and also with your, your knowledge of the brainstem, <laughs> avoid regions where you, you know there's sort of high stakes. Okay, great, great. Uh, Mike, do you want to give your case? Yep. Second. Thank you again for uh, taking the time to talk to us. It was a really great summary of all the different surgical considerations for each of these tumors. Uh, th this this case I uh, came up upon uh, was pretty interesting. So, 35 year old male with no significant past medical history presented with worsening dysphagia and uh, instability with multiple falls. Uh, on exam, grossly neurologically intact with no focal deficit. Um, you can see on the MRI here, he's got this large cystic lesion with a uh, nodule enhancement. Um, you know, working diagnosis was hemangioblastoma at the time. Uh, but in terms of the surgery, the surgery was uh, pretty complicated in that we did the suboccipital craniotomy, the cyst was decompressed, and you know the tumor was visualized. But as soon as any attempt to move this tumor caused the patient to either become severely bradycardic or to the point of asystole. Um, so not sure if you've stumbled upon this uh, at all during, I know you talked about, you know, motor M MEPs yeah. and SPPs, uh, but, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, cardiac, cardi uh, hemodynamic instability, uh, what pre-op anesthetic considerations do you have? Uh, or do you, you do transvenous pacing? Yeah, well, well, thanks. Uh, you know, this, <laughs> Michael, this is a really tough case. I also thought at first it might be hemangioblastoma. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't really have a peel. I don't think it reaches a peel surface. So it kind of um, goes against it for that reason. But um, in any event, um, it still could be something like, um, uh, you know, an astrocytoma, glioma, you know, ependymoma, it could be a variety of different uh, lesions. Um, and your approach was exactly what I would do, but I must tell you as a surgeon, I hate it when there's all these cardiorespiratory changes that occur that, that you're informed of by the anesthetist when they happen, when you're operating, because that's nothing will, you know, give you pause in a greater way than hearing that from the anesthetist and, and see, and hearing, you know, the heart monitor and uh, everything uh, changing, uh, you know, you have to be very safe in this region and location. You have to pay attention to the the cues that you're getting from your anesthesia colleagues and what you know is safe to do and, and what isn't. So you're you're showing a couple of um, of reprints here from um, titles from articles. Uh, personally, I have not done transvenous uh, pacing. Hmm. And I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have prepared for that up front in this uh, particular case. Right. But I I wondered if you were able to do a biopsy and, and what did it show. So they weren't able to do a biopsy at the time, uh, but interestingly enough, so this is, so the patient did well postoperatively. His dysphagia improved, his walking improved, just most likely from the cyst decompression. Um, he was initially referred to radiation oncology, but, you know, after discussion in tumor board, you know, radiation wasn't deemed an appropriate, he wasn't deemed an appropriate candidate for radiation. Um, so they went to get a second opinion. Um, this was a two-month post-op MRI. You can sort of see that this, cis fluid is now reaccumulating and he actually underwent a second uh, surgery for resection. Um, and this time, for some reason, when they went in, they, there was no hemodynamic instability, no bradycardia. Yeah. Um, they were able to get gross total resection. I can play this video, brief video, just on when they did the opening myelotomy. Yeah. Um, was wondering, you know, maybe it was stretching the fibers from the cyst 
that you know caused him to be more sensitive to these maneuvers versus the uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, so this is his post-op scan. He did really well. Uh, no issues since then. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, you know, I think that uh, you have to weigh everything in balance. And, you know, some surgeons might have uh, shied away from re-exploring. Um, but it's, it's fascinating that, that uh, you know, the second surgery was done and you didn't and there wasn't the same issue with respect to the cardiorespiratory changes. So um, I, it may be related to just the rapid decompression of the cyst, and maybe that had um, done something to the critical and, and vital centers in the brainstem, um, but I, I probably will remain unexplained. But the fact that it uh, could be operated on as a hemangioblastoma, you got a complete resection, yeah. is going to be very good news uh, for this patient. But these lesions, uh, hemangioblastomas in this area, uh, they're, they're not, I would say, totally rare, and you'll come across them. And the approach to these should be a, an attempt at complete resection, but bearing in mind the safety um, of doing surgery in this location and the fact that these can be very vascular lesions. Uh, this one probably wasn't too bad, but they can be you know, like an AVM almost trying to remove them. And if you're in the brainstem trying to remove an AVM, you, you kind of know what you're up against. So uh, you have to be as careful as possible, use all the, uh, the, the tricks and the tools that I was talking about that you that you used here, and uh, you'll get a good result. Yeah, the, the only pre-op considerations they had was they just had atropine ready in the room and they had defibrillator pads on the patient ready to go. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, and uh, doing some literature review on the transvenous pacing, you know, the biggest drawback, which is, you know, based on your talk is basically contraindication using transvenous pacing is that it interferes with the MEPs and SSCPs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's a great case. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, great case. Good learning point for, for all of us. And so um, let's see if there's any more questions here. Um, yeah, no. So, so again, thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic talk. I think uh, we all definitely learned something from that talk and there's so much more work to do, but, uh, but really appreciate your time, Dr. Rucka uh, and everybody else for their cases. Um, thank you okay, again okay. and everybody be safe. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Take care. Thank you. See you.